ascribe to the Creator glory and honor. The voice of the Holy One hovers over the waters and speaks creation into being. Ascribe to the Holy One strength and peace. The voice of the Sovereign One calls for justice, love, and righteousness. Ascribe to the Omnipresent One's power and gentleness. The voice of the Gracious One gives life and reigns forever and ever. Amen. God, you come among us in the fullness of your being and affirm the fullness of our mind, body, and spirit. In you, we find joy and pleasure. In you, we claim peace and hope. In you, we arise to greet a new day and a new way of being. Shape us in this time together in that we might reflect your goodness and your compassion. Amen. believe it says seated. God, we confess our need of you in every aspect of our lives. Lift us up from the valleys of despair and hopelessness. Free us from the societal norms, pressures, and conventions that conflict with or diminish your kingdom. Remind us of our baptismal promises and commitment. Release us from shame and fortify us with grace for a new life. Amen. Our scripture today comes from John chapter 15, reading verses 1 through 8, if you choose to follow. I am the true vine, and my father is the gardener. 
He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes, so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers, such as branches are picked up and thrown into the fire and then burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. For this is my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. May God give blessing to his word, and now for the understanding. You know, throughout the Gospel of John, there are many statements that Jesus makes, and they're called the I am statements. And here are seven of them. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. Mm. Do you remember these? I am the truth and the life. And then the last one, the seventh one is, I am the vine. And these are all illustrations of who Christ is and how he interacts with us and how he interacts with God. You know, this is the last of the seven I am's that was put in this gospel. And these I am's were all to illustrate and confirm the deity of that child that was born in Bethlehem. All goes to say, that's who he was. All of these things. In this child given for you and I. You know, the Old Testament portrays Israel as God, and Israel is the vine that is connected to God. And that's often said in Psalms 80 and in Jeremiah 2. Talks about Israel being connected to God as a vine. So that illustration was used earlier, even before John's gospel. And this was actually a wonderful covenant that God had established with the Israeli people, with the Israelites. A covenant that he said, if you are in me and I am in you, then I will give you all the blessings that I have. You can receive all that. But you know, Israel at some point in time ended up being unfaithful. They wanted to go away from God and they wanted to be on their own and do their own thing and worship their own gods and do as other nations had done. And some of that was due to their own captivity. In that, Scripture tells us that the vine then becomes empty. It becomes withered. Because they're not, Israel is no longer connected with God and the divine. Then the vine comes out in a new situation in the New Testament, in the Gospel of John. And it talks about now our union with Christ. That we also can be connected as branches to the vine and then the vine is connected to God. Hmm. Here it's being used again to represent us. 
and our relationship with the divine. You know, in Hampton Court, and that's in London, England, there is a wonderful thousand-year-old grapevine. It's huge. Thousand-year-old, can you imagine all that has grown on this vine in a thousand years? It has branches that reach out 200 feet from the main vine. Oh, I can't believe that. And actually, at the main root of this vine, it is actually almost two feet across. That's how thick the root is. Can you believe it? Am I too big? I'm bigger. I'm the fish story. Two feet. Okay, here we go. Two feet. I can't imagine being 200 feet out from the main vine and still being able to produce good quality grapes. But they do. And they produce something like, if I remember, something like 20 tons of grapes every year. I can't imagine that. But this one vine has lasted all this time. I can only imagine that the reason this vine has lasted and grown so long is because there is a gardener somewhere in there that attends to this particular vine for the community. Must prune it, must garden it, must do whatever it needs, must feed it, whatever. I can't imagine. That same image comes out here in John's Gospel. Since Jesus identifies himself, himself as the vine, he describes God then as the vine dresser or the grower or what we would call today the farmer. <laughs> How many of you have ever worked on a farm? Have you? Okay, you need to get out there in the garden and in the farms. Yeah, how many have worked in a garden? Ah, well, that's pretty good. There you go. Then you realize that if you leave your garden for a week, two weeks, three weeks, what takes over? You got it. And what do the weeds do? They choke out. All your good vegetables, don't they? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't pay to allow the weeds to get in there. Well, in this story, in this illustration of the vine in John, Jesus identifies his father as the vine dresser, the gardener, the farmer. He also kind of takes a subordinate role. He said, God is the main source, and then I am the vine. I connect in to that source, and then you connect into me. You're all the branches. Wow. You know, first we notice that he, that in order for Jesus to be the vine, and we are the branches. He nourishes us. The gardener God nourishes us, provides us, allows us to abide in the vine. And in doing that, he allows us to stay healthy. <laughs> Can't do a whole lot without nourishment can't do a whole lot without water. And secondly, what God does is he prunes back the things on the vine, the branches on the, vine, on the vine that have gone dead or are no longer producing fruit. Hmm. And why do you think he does that? Why do you think he prunes away the dead stuff? It's because even the dead stuff takes away nutrients from those things that are alive. 
doesn't pay to hang on to the dead stuff. It pays to prune that back so that true nourishment can come to the branches and then produce fruit. Wow. You know, there are three characteristics that describe a healthy branch. And this is all in here in different words, but it also says that the branch abides. It's connected. It also grows. That's the second thing. And then it produces fruit. All of these things are possible, but you first have to abide. You have to first be connected. It's amazing to me that nature is even in this illustration and how John picks out something that would appeal to the common person so we can understand our relationship with God. How simple that is. You know, during the Christmas holidays, I went to visit a friend of mine who had just recently had her shoulder replaced. She was in a lot of pain, but she was recovering, trying to recuperate, and I visited for a while. And as I'm getting ready to exit the door, she said to me, see this plant here? It's a parsley plant. And I looked down, and it did not look like a parsley plant. I said, oh, is that right? That's a parsley plant. OK. She said, Faith, I know you like to garden, and you like to putz out there in the weeds and all that stuff. Why don't you take this plant home and see if you can revive it? And I looked at the plant, and I thought, I really need to do Father, Son, and Holy Ghost <laughs> something to help this poor plant. <laughs> I said, OK, I guess I'll take it home. So I took it home. I put it on the shelf near the window and whatever. Stayed busy for a few days. And after a day or so, I looked back at the plant. And I had a conversation with this plant. And I said, I want you to know that it looks like your life might be over. I realize that all life must come to an end. And I am not saying that I can help you in any way, but I am going to try. I am going to try. The plant was barely functioning. I saw one leaf just kind of go like that. I finally decided a strategy that I was going to use. So what I did first was I began to cut away all the dead branches. I figured they're no good. They're not producing any parsley. And then I fluffed up the soil a little bit. And then I got some water and I put some food in it. And I began to give this plant nourishment twice a week. You know, I didn't look at it very much. I let it sit in the sun, whatever sun Ohio has. And a week and a half, two weeks went by, and all of a sudden I looked down in it, and I saw these new little sprigs just coming out of the main root, the body. Oh! I thought, wow, I can't believe this. It actually is alive under there. And I doctored it a little more. I fluffed it up. I said, OK, conversation is helping. Let's have a dialogue today. And I talked to it and whatever. Went a couple of days more, and more sprigs came out. More shoots came out. I thought to myself, God has answered my prayer here. I fed it, I loved it, and it is growing. Hmm. You know, it kind of taught me a lesson. So when I got to prepare for this sermon, I thought back on my parsley sprig. And I thought, you know what? Boy, this represents this scripture. But what first had to happen 
And then I asked myself, as a branch, and I'm a branch, what is it that I need to do in order to, for me to grow? In order for me to produce fruit, if I'm going to do that, if there is something that comes out of my life, what is it that I have to do? In reading back to John's text, the first thing I realized was I had to be connected. I had to be connected with the divine. And Jesus kind of tells us that he is that vine. In fact, in this scripture, you read it so many times, the word abide. We don't often use that in our daily language anymore. What does it mean to abide in something? It means to be connected. I often thought of, have you ever heard of the song, Abide With Me? Yeah. I'm sure you have. Henry Francis Light wrote the song. And I opened it up the other night when I was preparing for this, and I said, I wonder if this song, this hymn, has any words that would be meaningful to us. We've sang it. Do we know what it says? And the first verse says, Abide with me, fast fall the even tide. The darkness deepens, but Lord, abide with me. When other helpers fail and comforts that I need flee, help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. I fear no foe with thee at hand to bless. Ills have no weight and tears no bitterness. Where is death's sting? Where the grave? And then the victory. I triumph still if you'll abide with me. I think of that song, and sometimes we sing songs and we don't really think about what they say. But the first relationship that we have to have with Jesus, the vine, is the ability to abide. In knowing that we can't do this, we can't flourish, we can't develop, we can't grow on our own. It takes us being connected to Christ. You know, sometimes we think that all of our works and our doing is our righteousness, is our fruit, and it can be. But it doesn't mean that because you do and you're busy and you're doing good for the church and the world and the people that you are even connected. Connection goes far deeper. It's tapping off the resources of Christ. Hmm. You know, it's not based and our nourishment isn't based on all the scriptures we have memorized since we were children. The nourishment doesn't come necessarily by how many times we attend church. It doesn't matter how many charities we give to. It matters where our heart is and if we're connected to Christ. So how do we get connected? We put all these ideas out there and people say to me, but I don't know how to do that. What do you do to get connected to Christ? (laughs) Well, I'd like to say it's easy. It's a formula. It's one, two, three. Do this and you'll be connected. I would make lots of money if I could do that. But I will tell you this, that just like gardening takes work, (laughs) being connected to the divine takes effort and work as well. You know, it's just like being married. If you're any bit married today, still married or been married, you know it takes work. 
there's no yes I do and I promise you and then it's all over. No, it takes years of work. It takes being connected in heart and soul and mind. And we must do the same with Christ. You know, our spiritual nutrients, our nourishment, comes from Christ. You know, we have to learn to set our minds into a good place with God. We start with our minds. And then maybe we go to our hearts, and we focus our hearts, our emotions, on God. And then we begin to realize that when our minds are in God's heart and in God's mind, we will begin to think and act as Christ. Mm. We learn it from him. We do. You know, when we surrender ourselves to Christ, and that means giving all, we will be able to grow as branches. We will be able to bear fruit. We will be able to do good things in the world as God's representatives because we've gotten the nourishment from Christ. Hmm. How do you do that? Maybe it takes starting in the morning and saying, God, this is a new day when you're brushing your teeth or you're having your cup of coffee or you sit down and you have a meditation by yourself. Whatever works for you, whether you're driving in your car and you're on your way to work, do you begin the day and ask God to be in your presence, in your thinking, in your feeling, in your doing? Maybe we need to do that several times in a day. And besides abiding in Christ, it also means having the commitment to grow. And it says that in John 15, 5. He says, abiding means opportunity to bear fruit. And that takes work. The passage doesn't necessarily define what kind of fruit you're going to bear. And I like to think we all have different fruit. (laughs) You're not all a banana. (laughs) You're not all a pear. You're not all an apple. We are different people with different personalities and different gifts. But in that, we can bear fruit. When I think about spiritual fruit, I think about Paul's writings in Galatians when he's talking to the church. And he says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and think of these things, is love and joy, peace, forbearance, kindness and goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Maybe today is a good day to begin to connect, to abide. Maybe today is a good day to grow. Abiding, connecting to Christ, that's amazing. And if we do, if we all do, we will bear fruit for the glory of God. For the glory of God. Amen.
God, we come to you this morning with heavy hearts. We know that you understand our sorrow and our grief. Lord, we know that you can be a presence in our lives when these events take place. Although we are in pain, we are in a time of loss, we also rejoice for Denny's homegoing. We know that now he is with you in eternal rest and peace. But we know there are many that are aching today, are sad, are remembering. Be with Marilyn and the family as they grieve. Lord, we also remember Don and his family, his family that had to say goodbye. Be with them. Be with Rusty and Karen today that are both ill. Lord, we know that you can help them. You can be a presence, a comfort, a peace. We also pray for those on our list that are going for procedures, for others that may be headed toward surgery, for those that are home today and ill and could not be with us. Be with them. Provide healing in whatever way possible. Lord, we also ask that you be with us today as we leave this church and we go and do mission, missions for you. Help us to love the world. Help us to connect into the vine that we too can bear fruit. Help each of us in our own concerns and our needs that maybe we can't even say aloud, but you know and understand. And we pray the prayer that you taught your disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed it be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand. 